Uh, welcome to the March 22nd, 24th, 2022 Social Equity Working uh, Meeting. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to ask today's interpreter, Nancy, to introduce herself and walk through how to access our interpretation services for today's meeting. Good morning, my name is Nancy Hand and I'll be the interpreter for today's meeting. I will give the Zoom instructions in Spanish and then repeat them in English. Eh, para hacer uso del servicio de interpretación, favor de desplazarse a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom, donde aparecen los controles. Haga clic en el icono de interpretación, que es un globo terráqueo, y seleccione Spanish, español. Si está utilizando la aplicación móvil de Zoom en un celular, tableta, etc., presione los puntos suspensivos o tres puntos, luego interpretación, interpretation, y luego el idioma. To use the Zoom interpretation feature, please, please scroll to the bottom of the Zoom screen where the meeting controls are. Click on the interpretation icon, which looks like a globe, and select English as your language. If you are joining using the Zoom mobile app on a cell phone, tablet, etc., please press the ellips, ellipsis, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now I am going to ask our working group coordinator, Jane Clough, to confirm if we have a quorum. Yes, we do, Chair Moreno. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'd like to review the process for both the working group members as well as members of the public who wish to speak under public comment. Uh, for working group members, when you'd like to speak, please click on the raised hand icon in the Zoom control panel. Uh, you have control of your video and mute, so please click the raised hand icon and turn on your camera when you'd like to speak and I will call on you. Uh, do we have any questions before we continue? Hearing none, uh, Jane, would you please provide a quick reminder of how the public comment will work? Yes, as noted on the cover page of today's meeting agenda, uh, in addition to emailed comments, the public also may provide live comments during today's meeting. To provide a live verbal comment during the meeting, please join the Zoom meeting either by computer or phone. At the time uh, uh, for public comments, members of the public are advised to, quote, raise their hands if you wish to provide comments. The raised hand feature can be found at the bottom of the, tool, the Zoom toolbar for those who are joining via computer or by entering star nine for those joining via telephone only. The chair will call on members of the public by name of those joining via computer and by the last three digits of your telephone number for those joining via telephone. All comments received prior to the close of the meeting will be made part of the meeting record. The instructions for providing live comments also are on the bottom of the cover page of today's meeting agenda which can be accessed from the homepage of Sandag's website at www.sandag.org. And I'll return it to you, Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna move on to item number one, which is welcome and, uh, welcome and introductions. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity for all our working group members to introduce themselves, uh, their organization, and also the area of the region that you serve so the public joining us today are aware. I will start with Alliance for Regional Solutions. Good morning, Craig Jones with the Alliance for Regional Solutions. We're a robust collaborative of over 70 community organizations and service agencies um, and uh, the jurisdictions in North County. Uh, we are, our area of service is North San Diego County, uh, largely north of Highway 56. Good morning, everyone. Thank you and good morning. Uh, moving on to Bayside Community Center, Linda Vista Collaborative. Uh, good morning. I'm Kim Heinley, uh, Executive Director at Bayside Community Center, and I'm filling in for my colleague, Rose Ceballos, uh, who is normally the member of the Social Equity Working Group. Uh, we predominantly serve the Linda Vista community in the North Central San Diego region. Thank you. Thank you. Casa Familiar. Okay, we'll move on to City Heights, CDC. Good morning, everyone. My name is Randy Torres Van Vleck. I'm the Director of Policy and Planning at the City Heights, CDC. We serve the Mid-City area. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the Chula Vista Community Collaborative. Good morning, everyone. My name is Omar Calleros. I was the Director of the Chula Vista Community Collaborative, and we serve the City of Chula Vista, and even down into a little bit of South San Diego. 
um, how that uh, on this proposal rolls into. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to El Cajon Collaborative. Good morning, everyone. I'm Carol Lewis with the El Cajon Collaborative. <clears throat> we serve El Cajon, the city, and also representing East County. Thank you. Uh, Niall Sisters Development uh, Initiative. Good morning. Um, my name is Elizabeth Liu. I am the president and CEO of the Nile Sisters Development Initiative. Uh, we, Nile Sisters, has been serving the community for the last 20 years. Uh, here in San Diego, we are serving uh, City Heights, uh, Lemon Grove, and we also cover El Cajon City through our partner, uh, Mohamed Tuama. And um, we are happy to be part of Sandak Initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, National Latino Research Center. Good morning. My name is Konani Martinez, and I'm the faculty director of the National Latino Research Center at Cal State San Marcos, representing North County, San Diego. Thank you. Olivewood Gardens. Good morning, everyone. My name is Claire Grebner. I'm here on behalf of Olivewood Gardens and Learning Center with my colleague, Rosina Lizaraga. We serve National City and San Diego South Bay. Thank you. Uh, Samahan Health Center. Hello, good morning. I'm Fess Seligman, Grants Director for Operation Samahan. And Samahan Health Center is a federally qualified health center that serves the underprivileged and underserved communities in the North and South region. And we serve the National City and South Bay region under this collaborative. I'm, I also have here with, with me, Lorna, who's in the listen mode. Thank you. Uh, Urban Collaborative Project. Good morning, uh, Barry Pollard. Uh, we service Southeastern San Diego. Um, and uh, I guess that's it. Thank you. Uh, good, morning. Vista, good morning. Vista Community Clinic. Good morning, everyone. I'm Erica Leary with uh, Vista Community Clinic's Health Promotion Center, and we are working in uh, communities in Oceanside and Vista for the Sandbag Regional Plan. Thank you. Uh, we'll go back to Casa Familiar. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Monica Hernandez with Casa Familiar, and we're serving San Isidro in the South Bay region. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Now, do we have any comments from the public clerk? Jane? I don't see any. Sorry, I was muted, yes, as I was speaking. And <laughs> no, I don't see any raised hands from the public. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the next item. Uh, next item, item number two is member and public comment. So if working group members have any comments or announcements of interest to the rest of the working group, uh, please raise your hand at this time. Let me see, I don't see any hands raised. Anybody from the public? Okay, we see Mr. Mohamed Tuama. The floor is yours. Hi, good morning, everyone. My name is Mohamed Tuama. We're not officially part of the group, but we're through partnership with Nile Sisters. Um, I'm from the Newcomer Support and Development. We represent the Middle Eastern community of San Diego and through the partnership with Nile Sisters, representing the refugee and immigrant community in El Cajon and East County. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brian Pollard? Uh, yes. My only public comment is I'm on the line uh, listening to the Better Build San Diego from the um, the Planning Commission. And let me suggest that the CBOs in the city of San Diego pay careful attention to this. Um, one of the things they want to do is um, uh, increase the diff funds and make it a citywide sort of one size fits all. Um, needless to say, um, communities of concern cannot stand for the increase. And the question that I have, which I'm sharing this with all of you guys, so you can get involved in this, is it would be nice to see areas that have been identified as redlined areas focused upon in this opportunity with the Better Build San Diego. Most of us 
in that area. So my suggestion is um, get in the loop. There's some outreach sessions that are planned um, and um, people that we can directly talk with. With an outside possibility, Chairperson Marino, maybe we can get them to come here and make their presentation to our CBOs. Um, and uh, that way we can ask questions directly and um, not get left behind because I know we all have a lot of things going on. This is gonna be kind of important. This is addressing diff fees, development impact fees, which means infrastructure, which means housing, which means road improvements, the whole nine yards. So um, that was my public comment. I wouldn't have said it except I, I'm listening to it at the same time of partnering here. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pollard. Uh, Randy Torres Van Vleck. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I just wanted to share that on February 12th, uh, we did a bike ride, the Creek to Bay community bike ride from the New Roots Garden uh, all the way to the Bay. And we stopped at uh, the first stop was at the uh, Transportation Expo, Southeast San Diego, organized by Barry and the Urban Collaborative Project. Yay. And we had 60 people, it was like a 92 wow. degree day amazing we're joined by a lot of incredible leaders from the region like dr stan rodriguez from kumiai community college jane was there as well some of the partners here like from environmental health coalition joined in climate action campaign and a lot of friends in the transportation and justice and, and social equity space uh, we rode um to barrio logan and we saw uh, we met with victor ocho who is painting a live mural at chicano park at that time and he spoke for a while and Gonzalez spoke community organizer. We went all the way to the Bay, just like the sign says, um, that's about um, access to the Bay for, for our historically excluded communities. Um, and we met with Port Commissioner Sandy Naranjo at the Bay. Um, and she talked about the importance of access to the waterfront. So it was a great day. And thanks to everyone who came. And we're going to continue to do more of these events. So we appreciate you. And the flyer is the one that's my background, or my, my profile image. So if you're curious what that is, that's what that is. But thanks to everyone who came out very or is Dina his his event that we we stopped that was fun thank you um I don't see any more hands raised from our panelists so uh turning it over to the members of the public this is your opportunity to address the working group on any issues within the jurisdiction of Sandag that is not on today's agenda uh, do we have any comments clerk I do not see any hands raised from the public Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to the next item. Uh, item number three uh, is approving the uh, meeting minutes from January 6th, 2022. May I have a motion to approve the January 6th, 2022 minutes? I'll make the motion. Ooh, can you say your name? May yeah. I get a motion? I didn't catch that. I think Mr. Brian Pollard uh, moved and Omar, I will second. Awesome. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, and I'll call on the clerk for the roll call. All right. So, um, Alliance for Regional Solutions. Approve, yes. Bayside Community Center. I think I need to abstain because my colleague was the one who was on the working group for Bayside okay. that day. Agreed. Uh, Casa Familiar. Aye. City Heights CDC. Yes. Chula Vista Community Collaborative? Yes. El Cajon Collaborative? Yes. National Latino Research Center? Yes. Nile Sisters Development Initiative? Yes. Hollywood Gardens? Yes. Samahan Health Centers? I will need to abstain because I was not in the meeting. It was Lauren. Okay. Hmm? Uh, and uh, Urban Collaborative? Uh, yes. And Vista Community Clinic. I'm sorry, I need to abstain as well. I believe Nanette um, was representing us at that meeting. Okay. All right, this passes with the majority. Wonderful. Um, so item one passes unanimously with those members present. Uh, and we're going to move on to item number four, which is the chair's report. Uh, last month, Sandag officially uh, held 
the ribbon cutting ceremony and community bike ride for the grand opening of the 4th and 5th Avenue bikeway. Uh, this project adds more than four and a half miles to our regional uh, bike network. So big applause uh, for that. Um, also, Sandag uh, held a binational summit for leaders from the United States and Mexico on the future um, Otay Mesa East port of entry. Um, it's exciting to see all levels of government working together to improve our uh, shared region. Now, if uh, working group members would like to make any comments or have any questions on the chair's report, uh, please either turn on your camera or raise your hand at this time. I don't see anybody. Uh, do we have any comments from the public? I don't see any hands from the public. Wonderful. Okay, so we're moving on to the consent item. Um, item number five is a consent item on the restructuring of Sandag's working group. Uh, this does not involve the working group. Um, it, 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 not, it does not involve our working group. Uh, but if anybody would like to discuss, please let me know. I believe there is a graphic available. I don't know if we have that up. Kat, do you have that? Yes, just give me if we can get that up. Um, While uh, they're working on that, just for your reference, um, it's uh, to attachment one for item five in the agenda packet. That's a visual breakdown of the restructuring. Um, also, it should be coming up. Is it up already? Wonderful. Yes. Okay, so um, if, if working group members have any comments about this restructuring, uh, please raise your hand at this time. I don't see any. So uh, clerk, do we have any comments from the public? I do not see any hands raised. Okay. So we're gonna move on to item number six. Thank you for putting that item up. Um, and moving on to item number six, um, it is the social equ equity baseline condition report. Um, as you all know, Sandag is developing a social equity baseline condition report uh, to better understand existing conditions and equity disparities throughout the region. Um, at our January meeting, we had our first discussion on the suggested social equity indicators and best practices, as well as what other agencies are doing. Uh, today, we have Paul Lafarga, who will be presenting uh, us with an update on the methodologies, uh, selected indicators and outline of the report. Uh, this is an important opportunity to share what you want Sandag to monitor, and I'm looking forward to all your input on, um, on this very exciting uh, project. I will ask, though, if we could allow Paul to go through uh, the presentation, and then we will have uh, comments and questions at the end. And Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair Mariano. Just waiting for the slide to come up. There we go. Thank you. All right, we'll all start now. So hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Paul Lafarga, and thank you for that update about what we talked about last meeting. Um, so today we're here to report back to you with our progress, and we're very excited to share what we have so far. Next slide, please. Okay, so the 2021 regional plan is the smartest, most equitable, ambitious, and transformational vision the San Diego region has embarked on, and it was developed through an equity lens with our stakeholders. The plan is eager to take on complicated challenges that impact our quality of life today, and this group has played, played a leading role in tackling the challenge of social inequity. Transportation projects have a significant effect on the quality of life for a region's residents by shaping access to jobs, education, housing, services, and recreational opportunities. Without proper planning and development, transportation systems can have a negative impact on the quality of life in communities. The construction of roads, freeways, and rail transit systems have historically placed health burdens on many low-income communities and communities of color. Transportation projects may physically divide communities, resulting in long-lasting social and economic costs. Therefore, it's important to understand the impacts of transportation investments on our most vulnerable communities. 
Today, what we were doing is establishing a social equity baseline conditions to understand the disparities in the region as we move forward to develop the 2025 regional plan. Next slide, please. Okay, since our last meeting, what have we done? So we've created a research method. We have reviewed other indicator reports. We've selected draft themes and indicators, and we have completed a draft report outline. Next slide, please. Thank you. So our research methodology. So I created a little triangle here, triangle here to try to demonstrate what we've done. Our process was driven by feedback we heard from the last meeting about this study's pace of completion. We heard that should be done expeditiously to roll out an early action much sooner than later, but we also heard that we should take enough time to put in an appropriate level of due diligence. With that in mind, we designed our recent efforts to meet somewhere in the middle. The foundation of the pyramid is a literature review, which is an overview of previously published works on a specific topic. This allowed us to gather an extensive inventory of potential indicators to use and to not reinvent the wheel. So sitting on top of the literature review is an analysis, and we need this to understand themes and indicators that were common and unique across six different governmental agencies. Also, since data accountability is one of the five interreliant actions that form the regional social equity planning framework, it was important for us to understand data sources for each potential indicator, including any data limitations or something that may affect the accuracy of how we measure equity in the region. Next slide, please. Okay, back to the literature review. This slide shows a list of best practices that we found through our research. We consider these reports to be best practices because of the indicators that were used, but also because of the processes that went into completing them. Oregon Metro, for example, went deeper in their process than we could probably do, but we really like their final products. So that's why we included it. SCAG provided us with an innovative way to measure inequities through their set of indicators. Again, our main goal here was to not reinvent the wheel. We found jewels of information from all the reports that included over 115 indicators and more than 20 thematic areas to choose from. So we see other ones that we looked at were San Bernardino County, Orange County, and then Sacramento Council of Governments, they're another MPO, and MTC up in the Bay, another MPO. Next slide, please. Thank you. So here we are to our analysis. Okay, so this helps illustrate the analysis that we did on top of the literature review, which remember was the pyramid's foundation. So I created an inventory of all themes and indicators so I could again quantify or count how many times a particular indicator or a theme appeared across all six of the reports that we looked through. We prioritize indicators that were a frequent hit, but also prioritize indicators that we felt were important to the region, but maybe not that widespread, like broadband connectivity, for example. It only showed up in SCAG's report. We also focus our priority on indicators that could be broken down by race and ethnicity. Now that we narrowed down our focus, we needed to create an inventory of data sources to see what data we already have and what data we still need to gather. It also gave us an opportunity to examine data that SANDAG already has to better understand any potential limitations. Next slide, please. Okay, I've been kind of technical, so just give us a moment to take in this aesthetically pleasing word art here. And it shows some of the common words that popped up. So we can see economy, environment, transportation. These were some of the, the themes that popped out um, more frequently. Next slide, please. Okay. Here's the same word art that shows some of the different indicators that came up. Unemployment rate was pretty high. Was, um, was mentioned a lot, I should say. <laughs> median household income as well. And then some of them not as much, like median hourly wage, but we still thought that was important. Next slide, please. Okay, these are the themes that we narrowed down. So demographics, economic vitality, environment, connectivity, housing, and education. Next slide, please. Okay, so here are the indicators within each theme. So right now we're looking at demographics. These ones are, are fairly standard across the board. 
race, ethnicity distribution, linguistic isolation, people with disabilities. Next slide, please. Okay, economic vitality. Our sustainable communities program works to make sure that the region is thriving. Housing and transportation burden is an important way to measure that because it goes beyond their traditional metric of looking at how much of one's income is spent on housing, but also looks at transportation, which is even more relevant in today's world of rising transportation costs. Next slide, please. Okay, the environment. So we know that climate resilience and vision zero is an important part of the sustainable community strategy. So here we're not only thinking about pollution burden in the urban core, but also thinking about how East County might be vulnerable to wildfire, how the coast might be vulnerable to sea level rise, and how our valleys might be in high flood hazard areas. And see if the accidents involving bikes and pedestrians touches on vision zero. Next slide, please. Housing. Okay, we are pushing for affordable housing in the region as part of the sustainable community strategy and are interested in better understanding the housing landscape in the region and how priority equity populations are affected. We are sure to include disparities between renters and owners in the region. Next slide, please. Okay, and that takes it to connectivity. So connectivity is not just about transportation, but also about opportunities. And everything is connected through digital access. We want to be able to understand who is riding on which mode of transit and what those relative investments are. So we also included share of transportation use at the bottom. Next slide, please. Okay, education. It has been established that one zip code generally influences educational attainment so we wanted to capture that as well. One of the indicators that might not be as clear here is student poverty. This comes from an idea that all youth should attend economically diverse and well-resourced schools. This indicator is the percent of students by school poverty level, which is defined by the share of students in the school that are eligible for free or reduced price lunch. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're at our next steps for the baseline report. So your feedback is very important to us. We're definitely going to incorporate what you say today as we move forward. We plan to present the drafts report most likely at the May social equity working group meeting. And then we're looking to release the final report in June. Our longer term ambition is to have an interactive map and data dashboard that could be for public use. Next slide, please. Again, my name is Paul Lafarga. My email is my first name, got my last name at Sandag. And then I'll take us to the last slide to prepare for discussion. All right, and so what you hear, see here is a full list of the themes and the indicators. Um, I see that we already have a couple of hands. Um, so could pose a discussion question or we could just get the conversation going. Um, Jane, as a clerk, what do you think here? I think the chair, the chair, oh, the chair. Uh, facilitate the conversation. The chair facilitates the conversation. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Chair Moreno? That concludes your, your presentation? Yes, ma'am. Awesome. Okay, members, this is your opportunity. Drum roll here. Uh, first up, I, we have uh, Ms. Faye, Faye Salmahan. Uh, the floor is yours. Hello, hi, good morning. Thank you for this very interesting discussion. So I just have a quick question. My question is about, um, I didn't see anything about health and wellness as one of your indicators. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important that the population that we're serving are also healthy and happy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And do you have any possible ideas of a way that you would like to see that measured? Yes, um, there's several because I work for a healthcare. Um, oh, okay. Clinic. Well, so we have chronic disease um, tracking, how many you have diabetes, obese, and have hypertension, life mort mortality. So those issues, I can email some measures that we're using at our clinic that probably, you know, that can be incorporated in this report. Yeah, I'll love that. I would love that. I'll reach out to you to get those. Thank you. Thank you, Faye. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Faye, for starting us off here. Uh, next up, we have Carol Lewis. Thank you. I was just going to piggyback off of that and just mention that HHSA has a great epidemiology department and all that information is also available through them. So awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And health and wellness is probably one of the most critical. So thank you. Okay. And just to interject a little bit, um, one of the issues that we also are looking at is that um, the county is uh, developing an equity indicator um, index process as well. And obviously they're the holders of that data. Um, so it's also kind of a, an issue of trying to see how, what are the areas that our agency has influence over versus what the county may have more influence over. So, but definitely we'll take that into consideration and we'll be sharing data. Thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna move on to Claire Grubner. Thank you. This is um, this is really great. I appreciate the work that's been done, and uh, these are important things to measure. I would also piggyback off of Faye about the importance of of looking at you know chronic chronic disease when we can, and also looking at food environments. Those you know our food environment is a huge indicator. Um, you know, looking at um, a ratio of, of fast food or grocery stores per capita. Uh, so just to add that into the mix, if that's a, a possibility. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, Kunani Martinez. Thank you. Was, my comment was just stated by Claire, um, looking at food deserts mm -hmm. and access to grocery um, healthy stores. Um, Mapping that out, especially in unincorporated areas um, up in North County, for example, up in the near the American Indian reservations where there's <clears throat> limited access to food um, and grocery stores, these types of things and getting access to those via transportation as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Brian Pollard. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to be really short because I'm still got both feet in two different waters today. Um, I, I guess, and it's the same thing that I'm looking at with this, um, the Better Build San Diego issue is, I don't know why people don't focus on the redlined areas in our city. I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm dumbfounded that that was caused by racist practices and procedures and policies and governing. And yet everybody that can change the conditions are not even addressing that. And so I'd, I'd like to know why that is the case. I mean, it's, it's obvious we're looking at all these measures. We know what really needs to be done, right? And I mean, go to those areas. Equity to me is bringing things up to a level area and then let's start looking at massive changes. I don't see that first sort of element that allows us um, to, to bring the water level up in those areas. Sally was right. We don't over here have enough sidewalks. We, our, our infrastructure is getting worse and worse and worse. And so I, I'm in favor of the overall movement of, of making things better for the city of San Diego and for the region. But we're, we're missing an opportunity to do the right thing. And we're talking all around it and we're making, you know, other decisions. We're collecting data that I think we already know what's going on. It's just kind of frustrating, you know, and this is the same comment I got with these folks I'm looking at here from the city, you know, <laughs> um, so I'm getting called on here to talk to them. Um, so let's, I'll, I'm going to still be on, but that's my comment. Well, thank you for your comment, Brian. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Pollard. Uh, we're going to move on to Craig Hello? Jones. Can you hear me? Mr. Pollard, you are not muted. Thank you. Mr. Craig Jones? Yes, thank you. Uh, just for context again, um, mm -hmm. it, it, pretty clearly, especially with the additions that have been mentioned here today, this will provide for us a good picture 
of where inequity exists today. What, what are the intents of how to use this? How will this be applied? Jane, do you want to take that or should I take it? Um, so Paul, can you um, let the chair? Oh, sorry. How yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, Paul, if you would like to respond to the panelist. Sure, so thank you. So we wanna be able to have a baseline understanding statistically of a snapshot of how things are going so that when we're in the future making transportation investments, we can look at areas that maybe need more attention and just kind of understanding the picture better overall. We forecast into the future, but we also wanna have a good idea of, of how things look right now. So basically, this will provide us a, a, a picture of where there is inequity today to, um, in order to direct where improvements should go. And, uh, and also, will this be used over time to measure uh, the effect and impact of programs and projects? Yes. yes. Okay. That's why we have to be a little bit careful of the type of in indicators that we utilize and the impact that Sandag as a as an agency has on those indicators. Um, so there's, you know, there's there's definitely some specific areas and then there's some sort of gray areas. And I just wanted to respond to to Barry. Remember that these indicators are, they have to then be geographically, they're geocoded, right? Most of them are geocoded. So where the power of redlining comes in is in the placing of these indicators, in the dispersion of these indicators geographically. Does that make sense? Mr. He's Paul, listening. he's listening to yeah. the meeting. <laughs> I, I believe our last speaker was uh, Mr. Craig Jones and I just wanted to confirm that that concludes his questions. Yes, thank you very much. I, I, I think what Barry was suggesting is that there's a, an historical context of all this too. I think these various indicators will show that, but it, it might be good just to include a map of historically redlined communities. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna move on to Miss Elizabeth Liu. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for the opportunity. Uh, like the previous speakers, it, this analysis is well done it makes it almost difficult to choose which one, uh, which priority. But for me, um, my priority one would be housing. Uh, in the community we serve, I've seen a lot of struggles uh, in housing um, followed by unemployment. Most of the people uh, we serve are either underemployed or basically no jobs. And this makes it very, very difficult uh, for them to take care of their families. We are talking about public transportation. And even to ride a, a, a bus, this $2.75 becomes a negotiation. That's how difficult it is. And then food does it. Because they are low income, because they live in horrible housing, conditions, even the kind of grocery stores in these uh, regions when you, when you see, you find a lot of junk foods, cookies, sodas, cakes, just completely, there is no healthy food for these people. And if, uh, you know, focus can be made into these uh, three um, needs, housing, employment, and food security. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Randy Torres Van Vleck. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, Paul and Jane, for uh, getting this going, this baseline report. Uh, I had a couple of questions about the attachment, attachment one, uh, just a few of the bullets on the, um, just curious about the contextual background. There's the, a bullet called Regional Action highlights Coronado Bridge, City Heights, I-15, the San Jacinto Border. Um, are those going to be like case studies, kind of like 
digging more deeply into what went on there from a regional planning perspective, yeah. and like a community organizing perspective. Right. And just understanding the um, sort of using, an, it, you know, case studies, youth studies from the region to, to highlight the impact of planning and, you know, dividing communities through infrastructure and then the impacts that that has on those communities and then what those communities have done to improve, um, uh, you know, to rectify that. Okay, great. Yeah, we're happy to help share what, what Yep, what we'll be happen. tapping you, Randy. For the SR15, we made a documentary about it, and uh, yep. I'll put that in the chat for anyone to see. Wonderful. Um, it's actually the State Route 15. It changes from interstate to state, State Route 15. So we call it the SR15. And then small, but I think language is important um, when you're talking about crashes. Um, folks in the traffic safety movement, we're trying to call them not accidents, but crashes. Mm -hmm. um, there was more accurate description um, of what happened. Um, because we can get into the cause later, but we want to establish that it's a crash first. And then from there, we assess um, what led to that um, that crash. But yeah, thank you for that. Appreciate it. Super. Thank you so much. I don't see any other panelists with their hands raised. Uh, so we are going to move on to public comment. Uh, Clerk, do we have any public comment? I do not see any hands raised. Maybe give folks a couple a second to okay but i'm not seeing any hands raised thank you well thank you mr lafarga we appreciate you being oh, here i've got i have one uh oh. carmela muñoz can you hear me yes good morning and thank you for the opportunity i wonder if um if the, the transportation issue that many students are facing probably across the region uh, will be taken into consideration. I know that uh, schools uh, don't provide uh, transportation anymore. And I know that many of our, of our communities are, have been impacted by this because many parents have to go to work and they really have no, um, no way to take their children to the schools, but also their parents who um, have no cars, have no way to transport the children to the schools. Do you think uh, that this can be incorporated into the education? Because it seems to me that if the children have no, or youth have no access to go to, have no transportation to go to, to school, I think they won't be able to um, to succeed. Uh, so I, I just want to make this comment. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Mrs. Munoz. Um, I don't see anybody else wishing uh, to speak in the public comment section. So we're gonna move on to item number seven. Uh, item number seven is an update on the 2023 Regional Transportation Improvement Program also known as the RTIP. Uh, Richard Radcliffe will present an overview of the develop, development process and schedule for the 2021 RTIP. Um, and uh, Richard, we have a pretty packed agenda today. Would you be able to limit the presentation to 10 minutes? Yes, Chair, yeah, I should be able to get it done well before that. <laughs> we appreciate it. Uh, we're gonna have a robust conversation about this. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Chair. And good morning, everyone. I believe there's a PowerPoint that should be coming up. Perfect, thank you. So I'm Richard Radcliffe and I'm a financial analyst with the Sandag Financial Programming Team. And I'm here today along with Sue Alpert, also from the programming team to share with you the development schedule and development process for the 2023 Regional Transportation Improvement Program, or RTIP. Next slide, please. Okay, so the last RTIP item we presented to this group was, I believe, at the end of 2020. And at that time, we were in the middle of developing the 2021 RTIP. This time around, we're coming to you a bit earlier in the process for the 2023 RTIP. As of January 28th, agencies have 
been entering their projects and have been scheduling their council meetings and public hearings. As you can see on the calendar shown on this slide, the draft 2023 RTIP project list will be ready for review by the Transnet Independent Taxpayer Oversight Committee or the ITOC at their May 11th meeting. For those of you that don't know what the ITOC is, the ITOC aids in the implementation of the Transnet program, which is the Sandag, sorry, San Diego region's half cent sales tax for transportation improvements. The Transnet program is administered by Sandag and as outlined in the ordinance and expenditure plan, the ITOC provides an increased level of accountability for the expenditure of Transnet funds. The ITOC is mandated by the ordinance to provide enhanced accountability for the expenditure of funds under the expenditure plan. The ITOC helps ensure that all voter mandates are carried out as required and develops recommendations for improvements to the financial integrity and performance of the program. Now back to the schedule. On July 1st, all signed council resolutions are due from local agencies. And then on July 13th, the ITOC will review the actual draft 2023 RTIP document as, long as, as well as the projects. And then on July 22nd, the Sandag board will release the draft 2023 RTIP for a 30 day public comment period ending on August 22nd. And on September 2nd, Sandag will host a public hearing on the 2023 RTIP at the transportation committee meeting. And then the Sandag board will be asked to adopt the 2023 RTIP and the air quality analysis at the September 23rd meeting. Next slide, please. Okay, so you might be asking yourselves, just what goes into the RTIP? The answer is any projects with federal, state, and or transnet funds get programmed in the RTIP. And in case you're wondering what programming is, it's a process required by federal law that requires that projects must be included in a transportation improvement program or TIP. This is necessary for funds to be accessed for expenditures. Next slide, please. This slide here shows the different types of projects that are contained in the RTIP. The projects in the Sandag Regional Plan only make up a portion of the projects in the RTIP. The majority of the projects actually fall into the operating and maintenance category. Next slide, please. Now let's look briefly at how the RTIP relates to the Sandag Regional Plan. Basically, the RTIP implements the projects in the first five years of the regional plan. The 2023 RTIP will cover fiscal years 2023 through 2027. The bullet points shown at the bottom of this slide highlight the key differences between the RTIP and the regional plan. I won't go, all, go through all the bullet points now for the sake of time, but you can see that there are major differences between the plan and the RTIP, such as the timeframes that they cover, how frequently they're updated, and just how much detail is provided for the projects in either document. Next slide, please. So just how do projects get into the RTIP? First, projects are conceptualized, then they are planned, and then they are added to the SANDAG program, program budget. Projects must be approved by a SANDAG board action before they can be programmed in the RTIP. Projects that are sponsored by the local agencies, the transit agencies, and by the state are also to, added to the RTIP following approval by these entities. Next slide, please. Now onto what is probably the most important question, how and when can you get involved with the RTIP? The answer is that there are numerous opportunities to get involved. The RTIP is updated every two years and it's amended quarterly. A public hearing is held every two years for the updates to the RTIP and amendments to the RTIP are posted for public comment on the Sandag website. Next slide, please. The best place to start though, as a member of the public is at the local community level. Sandag does not select the projects that are submitted for inclusion in the RTIP by the local agencies. Project selection happens at the community level. Local agencies will select their eligible projects and then submit them to Sandag for inclusion in the RTIP. We strongly encourage getting involved at this stage so you may have a say in what projects get included in the RTIP. Local jurisdictions, as I mentioned, have been scheduling their public hearings for the 2023 RTIP. And as you can see from the list shown on the right-hand side of this slide, we have received a number of dates from the agencies 
some are tentative, and some agencies still are TBD. This list will be updated as we continue to receive meeting dates from the agencies. And again, we strongly encourage public participation at these meetings as they are an opportunity to provide comments and feedbacks on the and feedback on the projects in your community. For more information regarding the exact meeting times and locations, please visit your city's website. Next slide, please. Once we have a draft project list for the 2023 RTIP, we will share the list with this group on the dedicated uh, Social Equity Working Group SharePoint page. This information will also be made available on the 2023 RTIP webpage. I've provided an example here on this slide of what a project will look like in the RTIP. Starting by going clockwise from the top left, the project description field is probably one of the most relevant fields to this group since it includes the project limits and the project location at the beginning of the description. Next in the top right, you have the page number of where you can find the project in the 2021 regional plan. Next, you have the funding on the bottom right with totals by phase. And then going to, towards the left, you have the funding summarized by fiscal year, and then the total funding on the project shown broken out by the different fund types. Next slide, please. Oh, there's a couple animations there. Thank you. Okay, so now I will hand it over to Sue Alpert so she can tell you briefly about the social equity analysis for the 2023 RTIP. Yeah, thank you very much, Richard. Um, I'm Sue Alpert, and as Richard mentioned, we work in the Financial Programming and Budgeting Department at Sandag. Um, so when we presented the 2021 RTIP to this group, Sandag made a commitment to provide an equity analysis for this next RTIP cycle. Since an equity analysis is not a federal requirement for the RTIP, this is something we needed to figure out how to do. So we've formed a multidiscipline team at Sandag with programming, planning, diversity and equity, GIS and modeling staff as part of these, this team. We began by reviewing what other agencies have done for their tips and reviewed lit the literature to develop a methodology that can be implemented with the data that we currently have available. So that is going to end up being an investment analysis that's based on project location. This analysis will tell us whether investments included in the RTIP in areas with vulnerable populations are at least equivalent to the percentage of that population. And we'll do this based on the mapping information included in the project submittals and overlaid on top of Cal Virus Screen. And that's an example of the mapping data in the slide there um, for a project. Um, we're currently have obtained this data for the 2021 RTIP, and we're doing um, an analysis of that data to provide a baseline and to refine the methodology. Once all of the 2023 projects are reviewed, we will process the same analysis on the 2023 RTIP data, and we'll provide the beginning of a trend, trend analysis. Obviously, we understand that there are other considerations besides where a project is located, that help to determine whether it is a benefit or detriment to vulnerable populations. Um, but we need more information that we've not been collecting to understand um, web, that benefit or detriment. So we've asked project sponsors um, for the 2023 RTIP to answer two new questions for every project that they submit. And one that those questions are, one, has a Title VI analysis been performed for this project? Um, and number two, to indicate what populations will benefit from this project. So the responses that we get to these questions will help us determine how much the project sponsors understand about the equity of their projects and where they are in applying equity principles to project selection. So hopefully this information will lead to a more nuanced analysis in future RTIP cycles. So we will have uh, this um, equity analysis will be an appendix to the 2023 RTIP and it'll be available in the draft that goes to transportation committee in July and is released for public comment. So I think that's all that we have. We wanna forward to the next slide. That's um, kind of just some um, contact information and Richard uh, put the web page, the links to the web page, and also there's a public site for the projects being submitted for the 2023 RTIP. So you can go to that public site at this link 
And if you go um, to the, where it says RTIP amendments tab, you'll see the list for the 2023 RTIP. So you can see those projects ahead of time. So that concludes our presentation. We're happy to take questions. Thank you, Mr. Radcliffe and Ms. Albert. We are gonna turn it over to our working group members. And so we will start with Mr. Craig Jones. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's been two years since we went through the last RTIP process, so my memory fades a little bit, but um, I think it's dramatically important to understand how projects get included in the RTIP. I think our hope would be that this particular RTIP will be different from the last one in that it will uh, more emphasize uh, the equity and, uh, aspects of the new regional transportation plan. Um, I, so Richard, you mentioned uh, a little bit about how projects are submitted to be included in the draft RTIP. You said that uh, proposed projects can be nominated, if you will, by the local jurisdictions, the city and the county, but uh, are, are, can projects, what are the other sources for identification of projects to be um, included in the draft RTIP? Well, so typically on the Sandag side, we have our, our projects that go in there as well. And on our side, you know, it's basically the, the need is determined and projects are conceptualized and then they will go through our process internally. And like I said, those projects require a board action to be included, to be programmed in the RTIP. The local agencies will basically, I guess, determine a need or establish a need on their end and you know they create projects in their their cips their capital improvement programs and uh that's why i was saying at the local level there you you know constituents will have an opportunity to comment on and um these essentially these potential projects and they submit them basically to us and we review them you know looking for you know whether the the use of the funding is correct and appropriate, uh, whether they are eligible under the Transnet ordinance. Uh, we'll also get projects from the state that basically are in the state's program. And so we just program them based on that. Um, I don't know if I've totally answered your question. And the transit agencies. And the transit agencies, yes, thank you. Okay, okay. Well, one of the things this underlines is that is that the structure and the emphasis of the RTIP is, to some degree, significantly a political issue. And, you know, the politics throughout our region varies. Some jurisdictions are more progressive than others. I think uh, we on, on this uh, working group would hope that uh, this particular new RTIP is really gonna move forward um, transportation access solutions other than the private automobile. So we hope that's the case. I, Will, my last question is, um, I see flexible fleets as being a real key, a dramatically important element of producing transportation equity and access that it doesn't exist today. Will flexible fleets kinds of projects and proposals be allowed to be included in this RTIP? It'll depend on the funding that's available for those projects. Um, that's kind of a challenge right now, um, finding the funding that's appropriate for flexible fleets. So if there are, there definitely are certain, um, you know, the 5311 type projects with the senior transportation mini grant type projects, it's not entirely flexible fleet, but yeah. those are included. Um, so yeah, we're looking for those projects to be submitted and funded. Okay, not quite clear. Uh, I mean, if if a local jurisdiction said we really want a flexible fleets in our community, but we're not clear what funding sources are available, could they begin to promote that? Or uh, they need to uh, identify a funding source in order to program it. So mm -hmm. if they want to use transit dollars, um, then they would program it. If... Okay. So Sandag can do that also. Sandag can identify or set up direct uh, transnet funding towards flexible fleets, yes or no? No, I don't believe so. We have, um, we do have a flexible fleets pilot that we previously funded and 
you probably won't see it in this RTIP because it's already the funding's already been provided to that project, although it's still being developed. Yeah. Um, so. Okay, well, that's, you know, as we move along, maybe not in this art tip, but in, in sooner rather than later, really like to see emphasis on flexible fleets implementation through all means. Thank you. Craig, just wanted to um, add just a little bit to that to remember that the R tip is programmed funds and it is updated every two years and it's amended every quarter. So mm -hmm. it's a very active document yeah. um just to keep that in mind you know in why the art the um the regional plan and the r tip are are you know it, it's the r tip is nestled in the regional plan but there mm -hmm. the r tip also documents mm -hmm. okay. all funding that is being um dedicated in the region and so just to give you an example that um the tribes also um, submit their programmed their their T T tip right so their their own they have their own tip a tribal tip that they submit to um, the Bureau of Indian Affairs and then they provide it to us and it's simply to document what projects and funding is being actively pursued you know actively worked on in the region so you're going to see and so one of the reasons we're doing the social equity analysis on the 20, 2021 RTIP, which is based on the 2015 regional plan, is to have a baseline and then be able to um, update, you know, have a, a have, as, as Sue said, have a um, point of reference then for the 23 RTIP, which will be based on the 2021 regional plan. Does that make sense? That does make sense. Again, I, you know, if if all of this is driven on where funding is already available, I, I think we need to create new funding for implementation of uh, flexible fleets. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to Erica Leary, followed by Randy. Hello. Thank you. Um, I was just going to ask if it would be possible at one of our um, not the formal work, not this meeting, but our um, when our CBOs come together, if Sandag staff could do a more simplified version of like case studies of how, like from the 2021 RTIP, a project that got put in there and then got funding and maybe a couple different examples of one that was driven with community input and worked through their city councils and maybe another one that was, I don't know, uh, a bureaucratic or something that continued from years past, it, just maybe two or three case studies. So we, it's so technical and for us to take this kind of information and translate it to community members so they can understand it, it gets really overwhelming. And I really appreciate like a, a school of rock version of the RTIP process. I love it. Like, like the bill, yeah. I'm just the bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. That that's a yeah. I can totally relate to that. Programming is kind of an animal uh, in and of itself. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, I, I definitely that that sounds like it would be very helpful and very useful for well, the community. Well, we we can we can try and see what we can dig out. Um, to be honest, we don't have a lot of insight into the local agency project submissions. They come out of their capital improvement programs and um, they get submitted. So we can maybe do a little digging and a little research and see what, mm -hmm. uh, what we can find out. Well, maybe what working with Jane to projects that are in the cities that, we, that, that the CBOs work in um, might, mm -hmm. might help narrow down the focus to, to find a few examples. Because mm -hmm. yeah. we know our politics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that, Erica. Um, does it conclude your comments, Erica? I'm sorry. Yes, it does. Thank okay. you. Okay, Randy Torres Van Vleck, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Um, it kind of builds on Erica's as well. Uh, and this is more, I guess, uh, first off, I, I guess, comment and recommendation for um, the staff and the chair overall. It'd be good, great to have these slides in the, uh, the, in the 
in the agenda. Um, there's only one page on the agenda for item seven that I see on the web page, and it's just like a basic fact sheet stuff. Can we get the slides included in the agenda packet? Sure. And the, the slides are based on that fact sheet. So it's just yeah. you know, it's basically the same information that's just put in the form of a PowerPoint. So it's except for the schedule, which would be good for them to have. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what it, can you summarize? And it'd be great to have like a slide that says this, what what new criteria is being utilized for the RTIP that will fact that will account for social equity. I'm not sure what you mean. Like the, you, you, can you go back to the slide where you asked the pose the two new questions that you're going to? It's data. That's a, a additional questions that are being asked in the project track. Okay. And who yeah. will? Who, who all will the jurisdictions those? submit into well, this. Or, data yeah, data. We're, we're asking all the project sponsors to answer those questions. Um, mm. and, and as I said, that, that'll give us insight into their understanding and, and their commitment to equity. I think that it's not necessarily the same as um, doing the mapping and investment analysis, but it'll provide another data point. Okay, so the, the local agencies, when they're requesting RTIP funding, they're gonna, they're gonna have to answer that question. Has the Title VI analysis been performed? What populations benefit from the project? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, yeah, I, 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 part of me feels like, I wonder if we could ask um, a couple other questions that are a bit more objective than what populations will benefit because there's different opinions about what a benefit is. Um, you know, the leadership of, you know, the 2016 Sandeg thought that widening the five freeway, the 94 freeway, pretty much all the freeways south of the, the eight, uh, most of them, I should say, um, they thought that was a benefit for the local communities. And we know that that increases vehicle miles traveled, which increases air pollution, and that increases traffic violence. So whether it's a benefit or not, um, I think it's kind of debatable. It'd be great to have some more objective question like will vehicle miles traveled be increased along the corridor? Will air pollution be worsened uh, along the corridor? Something that's a little bit more objective, I think would be, would be great. So that's kind of what I was, what I was getting at. My comment. So, we we do collect some of that data for federal performance information. Um, okay. so we might be able to cross track it. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Is there? Um, hmm. Okay. I mean, what what's the process for? How does Sandag does Sandag have internal criteria that you use to establish whether the project has regional transportation benefits? Could you? Be careful with what that is. Like when an agency submits a request, what do you see on your end that that leads you the send the agency to inform whether or not that is a a, um, a qualified like R two project? Well, I think Richard mentioned that we evaluate the projects based on the transnet ordinance and the appropriate use of funds per the ordinance. Um, as we move forward with um, implementing the some of the, the criteria that were in the policies that were set forth in the 2021 regional plan, amending those into the Transnet ordinance, that will impact um, the project selection process for local agencies. And, and certainly there is an effort to include social equity as one of the general, general what do we call it, Jane? The, the general principles or, um, I forget. Yeah. But yeah, that we'll ask agencies to um, basically attest to that they are um, considering social equity in their project selection. And so we don't have a lot of ability to review and evaluate that. We have to rely on them to do that. And, but we will ask them to attest to it in the uh, council resolution. Interesting. Okay, so it gives the the cities quite a bit of leeway, right, in determining how. Mm -hmm. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, this is this so me learn a lot. So thank you, appreciate it, and this is good to see this update. Yeah, and remember, um, and uh, to sort of uh, add to that comment, um, there is a process going. the The Transnet um, ordinance needs to be consistent with the regional plan. 
And so there's a process going on right now to amend the Transnet ordinance so that it will be consistent with the region, the 2021 regional plan. That's going on right now. So again, it's important to understand that some of these timeframes for the RTIP, the RTIP is a is really a dynamic document. Um, so the impacts of the 2021 regional plan may not be evident for a bit, you know, for a few years as the trans because we haven't amended the transnet ordinance yet. It's in that's in the in the process going on right now. And um, I'm going to ask the um, transnet coordinator to um, come to the working group meeting ne for next month to describe what's going on. Thank you. Appreciate that. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, any other panelists wishing to be wishing to speak, ask questions, or make comments? Uh, Craig. Yes, just one more question um, for clarity. The, the RTIP is or is not the only um, way to implement uh, the regional transportation plan. Are there other vehicles, other spending sources, other ways to move forward projects and programs that might not be included in the RTIP but are needed under the RTP? Yes, any, I think Richard said in the beginning, any projects that are funded with federal transportation dollars or transnet dollars need to be programmed in the RTIP. But if there are other projects that address initiatives and policies in the regional plan, especially type housing type issues, those dollars wouldn't be programmed. They're not federal transportation dollars. So um, those projects could be happening, um, but they wouldn't be included in the RTIP. Thank you. Again, just looking for any, any possible means of moving forward flexible fleets. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to public comment. Jane, do you see anybody wishing to be recognized? I do not see anyone's hands read, read, um, uh, among the public. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for the presentation. We're going to move on to item number eight. Um, and I just want to check in with everybody, uh, depending on the discussion for item eight, we will potentially be trailing item number nine until the next uh, uh, meeting. But item number eight, uh, we have the upcoming calls for projects for the Sp Sandags Specialized Transportation Grant Program and Access for All Program. Uh, we have Mr. Benjamin uh, Gambler and Mr. Zachary uh, Rivera, who will present an overview of these programs. And remember, once again, this is your opportunity to provide feedback on the on the programs. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Benjamin and to Zachary. Thank you, Chair Marino. Uh, are you all able to hear me okay? Great. <laughs> Good morning, members of the Social Equity Working Group. Uh, my name is Benjamin Gembler, and I'm excited to be along here along with my colleague Zachary Rivera to share information about two upcoming calls for projects for both the Specialized Transportation Grant Program, STGP, and the Access for All Grant Program, known as AFA. Next slide, please. So for AFA, to address the lack of wheelchair accessible vehicle or wave service statewide, in 2018, Senate Bill 1376 created the TNC Access for All Program. This legislation directed the California Public Utilities Commission, CPUC, to establish a program to improve accessibility of transportation network company or TNC services, such as Uber and Lyft for individuals with disabilities, especially those requesting waived service. For each completed TNC trip in a county, there is a 10 cent access fee levied as used in that same county to improve waived services. Any remaining funds that are not kept as an offset by TNCs that are improving wave access are put into an access fund for distribution through local access fund administrators or LAFAs. Last year, Sandag was selected by the CPUC as a LAFA for San Diego County for funding year 2021 and 2022. Next slide, please. So this will be the first year for the Access for All program in San Diego, San Diego County. 
And prior to Access for All, there has been little to no on-demand wheelchair accessible vehicle service in the region. Sandag's 2020 coordinated plan, the document that establishes a regional strategy to provide transportation to recognized transportation disadvantaged groups, discusses this disparity and the challenges it has brought to our region. AFA funding for the first cycle will be approximately two and a half million dollars for projects that are creating and expanding on-demand wheelchair accessible vehicle service for individuals with disabilities in the county. Next slide, please. So in order to be able to el be eligible to apply for the Access for All program, an applicant must be able to provide or contract with an entity that provides on-demand wheelchair accessible vehicle transportation services in the county. On-demand transportation is defined as the, tr as the provider that can fulfill trip requests within 24 hours through a service that does not follow a fixed route or schedule. Additionally, applicants must be transportation carriers that hold a charter party carrier permit or be a non-permitted transportation carrier that can meet the permit requirements, such as performing background checks and controlled substance and alcohol testing on its personnel, among other requirements. Next slide, please. Thanks, Ben, and good morning to all of you. Uh, the Specialized Transportation Grant Program is another competitive grant program administered by SANDAG. Established in 2006, it seeks to improve mobility for seniors and individuals with disabilities where existing services are unavailable, insufficient, or inappropriate. The STGP is composed of the FTA Section 5310 program and the local Transnet Senior Mini Grant program. Eligible applicants are nonprofit organizations and local governmental agencies. Eligible projects include support for volunteer driver programs, uh, travel training programs, um, and accessible vehicle purchases. Next slide. Thanks, Zach. So although there are distinct differences between the two programs, both Access for All and STGP are competitive, they're both competitive grant programs that have a process for applicants to propose projects to be considered for funding. So the call for projects refers to this process, during which time there is a 90-day window for applicants to create and submit proposals. Typically, we also hold pre-application workshops that inform potential applicants of the AFA cycle one call for projects, for instance, review grant program requirements and call for projects materials and answer any questions prior to proposal submission. Another important distinction between the two programs is how often each has a call for projects. For a specialized transportation grant program, which is developing the cycle 12 call for projects, this occurs every two years, and therefore funding is distributed for a two year grant period. However, with access for all, which is developing the cycle one call for projects, funding is distributed for a one year period. Next slide, please. So over the past couple of months, Zach and I have been talking to stakeholders in the region about the programs and the call for projects, discussing the state of specialized transportation and trying to get a better understanding of how both STGP and AFA can both best address the needs, barriers, challenge, and the challenges that exist. We met with several groups of stakeholders, including the Council on Access and Mobility, CAM, and the Sandag Social Services Transportation Advisory Committee, STEC. In addition, we held a specialized transportation workshop in February where we hosted over 40 attendees to really take a deeper dive to get feedback from stakeholders to better inform both the Cycle 1 AFA and the Cycle 12 STGP calls for projects. Lastly, a specialized transportation outreach survey was developed and distributed, which resulted in additional community feedback. Next slide, please. So what type of feedback did we get? Well, we uncovered some broad themes in the comments and responses during the past few months. Among them, the need for affordable services, uh, better availability of vehicles and service, uh, awareness of services in the community overall, a flexibility in funding and for service, and accessibility for users 
came across all as some of those main themes that stakeholders felt were important considerations for specialized transportation programs moving forward. Specifically, as this relates to access for all, this feedback has helped to inform the project evaluation criteria, such as the capacity to include users who don't have a smartphone or internet access, the provision of training that includes driver sensitivity training, passenger assistance techniques, and accessibility equipment use, inspections that conform with ADA specifications for transportation vehicles, and the ability to publicize and promote services to disability and limited English proficiency communities, as well as low income and minority areas. Next slide, please. So Access for All has a fairly compressed timeline, which is one of the reasons that this part of the presentation is, is informational in nature. Um, tomorrow, the Board of Directors will be hopefully approving the evaluation criteria we hope to use for scoring projects. And then next week, we are anticipating the release of the cycle one call for projects. The call for projects will end by July 1st, after which a period of application review, scoring, and ranking will take place during July and August. Funding recommendations will be brought to the Transportation Committee and Board of Directors in September. And pending approval, grant agreements will be executed in October. Finally, access provider services will need to commence in November. Next slide, please. We have additional information on Access for All and the Cycle 1 call for projects on our web pages. You can also reach out with questions via email at grantsdistribution at sandag.org. And that actually concludes uh, the AFA portion of the presentation. Um, unless there are any questions, uh, I will turn this over to Zach. Okay. Take it away, Zach, if we can go to the next slide, please. Perfect. So for the second half of our presentation, I'll be giving an overview of the STGP cycle 12 call for projects and then pose questions uh, to spur discussion. So if you can go to the next slide. Zach, yeah, I'm sorry, this is Vivian, if I may. Um, how many yeah. minutes will you need to conclude the presentation? Presentation, I would say about seven minutes. Okay, wonderful. I'll do my best. All right, so the, the existing goal of the STGP is to improve mobility for seniors and individuals with disabilities throughout the region. Currently, uh, there are also four program objectives. One, fund projects derived from the coordinated plan, which uh, Ben alluded to earlier. Fund innovative and flexible programs. Uh, three, provide incentives for coordination. And four, encourage cost efficient service provision. Next slide, please. There are also eight existing STGP evaluation criteria categories for a total of 100 points. So these categories include uh, project readiness and te technical capacity, coordination and program outreach, goals and objectives, operational slash implementation planning, cost efficiency and program effectiveness, operational sustainability, innovation, and lastly, performance indicators. And we can go to the next slide. So what I just covered were the existing um, uh, goals and objectives and um, evaluation criteria. And at, during the cycle of the STGP workshop or specialized transportation workshop, staff provided possible STGP cycle 12 goal objectives and evaluation criteria an emphasis on possible. So the draft goal presented was to improve mobility for seniors and individuals with disabilities by delivering effective, equitable, environmentally responsible and coordinated transportation solutions that address existing gaps in specialized transportation service. And the, the draft uh, objectives were uh, effectiveness to fund organizations that have the requisite financial, technical, and managerial capacity to implement cost-effective, innovative, and successful specialized transportation projects. Number two, equity, uh, to apply a social equity lens to ensure that specialized, transport specialized transportation projects benefit those who need them the most. Three, environmental responsibility, to promote healthier air and reduce greenhouse gas emissions region-wide, 
And then fourth, coordination to incentivize coordination among specialized transportation providers that reduces duplicative services. Next slide, please. Uh, there are also four draft uh, evaluation criteria presented that mirror the draft objectives presented. Uh, the first criteria was effectiveness, and what that what what could that uh, look like? So effectiveness could include many different factors such as cost effectiveness, innovation, and flexibility. It could refer to the fe feasibility of an implementation plan and a budget where the costs are justified, necessary, and reasonable. Next slide, please. Equity. Equity could refer to need, meaning that the proposed projects benefit those that need them the most. This in could include uh, the transportation disadvantaged, such as low income and minority populations, as well as those with limited English proficiency. Next slide. Uh, environmental responsibility was the next one. Um, and it is a criteria or could be a criterion uh, that could include evidence that the proposed project helps to promote healthier air and reduce greenhouse gas emissions region wide, uh, consistent with the 2021 Sandag Regional Plan. And we can go to the next slide. And the last one was uh, coordination. Uh, coordination could involve evidence the proposed projects do not duplicate services and are unique in collaboration with other specialized transportation providers. It could also refer to how an applicant would serve the community at large within the proposed project service area. Next slide. So to recap, there are four uh, criteria presented with effectiveness weighted the most at 40% followed by uh, equity at 30% and environmental responsibility and coordination weighted the least at 15% uh, each. Next slide, please. So for the STGP cycle 12 call for projects, staff anticipates updating the SANDAG program management plan, which documents kind of the procedures SANDAG uses to administer the SDGP. Next, SANDAG, uh, next, the SDGP Cycle 12 evaluation criteria are slated to go to the uh, Independent Taxpayer Oversight Committee, or ITOC, uh, Transportation Committee, or TC, and the SANDAG Board in June. Uh, pending board approval, the call for projects would be released in early July, and then applications would be due 90 days later. Next slide. So uh, SANDAG highly encourages prospective applicants and other stakeholders to visit our web pages um, that are included in the, in the slides. Um, and you can also email us at grantsdistribution at sandag.org with feedback and or questions. Um, so with that, we can go to the next slide and we'll open it up. Um, this is where I wanna hear from you. And I have a couple of discussion questions um, prepared. So, uh, I, and I would like to spend uh, maybe a couple minutes on each one. And if you did not attend the um, specialized transportation workshop, I especially encourage you to chime in. So we'll go through these one by one and we can also, um, I can answer any questions you may have afterwards. So the first question is what do you like or dislike about the existing SDGP goal, uh, objectives, and evaluation criteria. And we're can happy to jump back to a prior slide if you want to reference um, those those notes. Does that conclude your guys's presentation? It does. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, so now we're going to turn it over to pa uh, panelists. Uh, once again, this is your opportunity to ask any questions or to make any comments uh, to Ben and Zach. Uh, so I will start off with Ms. Faye Sal Saliman. So, um, thank you so much for this presentation and we're very excited to, to apply for this funding opportunity. But I just have a couple of questions. Number one, you mentioned about readiness. What do you consider as a ready project? 
or program for an institution that's applying for this grant opportunity. And also the cost, what is the cap that we can apply for? And yeah, those are my two questions. Sure. Um, so I can speak to the specialized transportation grant program. Um, in terms of project readiness, um, that's something that has to be determined for cycle 12. Historically, what that includes is whether an applicant has an established uh, a client base, whether they have an established um, or nearly established transportation program. The idea here is, is that when um, projects are authorized to be to receive funding, that they can begin soon um, so that the most benefit can be uh, derived from those projects as soon as they start. And then in terms of um, your second question of, in of funding, um, there are caps. Um, so that's something that could be consistent from the prior cycle to this cycle. Uh, the cycle 11 call for projects, the cap was uh, 600,000 per organization uh, per funding year. Um, and then the project minimum was uh, $30,000 per year, and the maximum was $250,000 per year. So uh, applicants historically have been able to propose multiple projects um, within the funding parameters, as long as it doesn't exceed the 600,000 uh, cap for uh, that applicant. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Craig Jones? Yes, uh, Zach, to address your question, number one, uh, what I like about this, it's, it, these are two um, funding uh, avenues that are longstanding. They've been around for many, many years uh, and provide needed um, transportation alternatives to seniors and disabled. What maybe I don't like about it is that the dollars are limited to those two populations, seniors and disabled. And there's there's need for much more transportation uh, alternatives for other populations as well. Um, and I, I understand that there's probably not a lot that we or Sandia could do about this because it's limited by the uh, funding sources themselves. But there is my feedback. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Um, anybody else wishing to be recognized as a panelist? I don't see anybody. Uh, so we're going to turn it over to public comment for this item. Do we have any public, uh, anybody from the public wishing to be recognized? I do not see anyone in the public with their hand up. Okie dokie. All right, you guys. So um, I am going, thank you for the presentation, Zach and Ben. We appreciate you guys being here. Um, I'm going to trail item number uh, nine to the next meeting. Um, it's just such an important discussion. I don't want to limit it. And we do have a hard stop of uh, 12 o'clock. Uh, so we are going to move on to item number 10, which is um, uh, topics for the next meeting. Uh, I'm going to suggest the following. We're going to get an update on the social equity baseline condition. Um, we're also going to hear today's item, item number nine, which was the regional digital equity strategy and action plan. Um, and also in April, the uh, social equity working group members and champions of the 10 transit lifelines and youth opportunity passes are being recognized by Casa Familiar with an abrazo award. Uh, so big clap to everybody on this um, on this, uh, right, on this panel. Uh, very excited about that. So we'll get an informational item on that. Um, as always, if there are any other suggestions for either the next meeting or future meetings, uh, please let uh, me or Jane know. Uh, we really appreciate you guys. And uh, do we have any uh, any comments from our panelists? Mr. Pollard, I see your hand raised. Yeah, just what I mentioned earlier for a topic is to get the, um what's it called, the uh, Better Build San Diego folks, if they could come before us with their program, that would be helpful. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank you for that suggestion. Any other panelists wishing to be recognized at this moment? Okay, I don't see anybody. Do we have any comments from the public, Jane? 
I do not see anyone. I, uh, yes, and Barry just lowered his hand. So no, I don't see anyone from the public. Thank you. And as always, you guys know, we can, uh, you guys can email us. Uh, so moving on to the next item, uh, our next meeting is scheduled for Thursday, April 28th, 2022 at 10 a.m. Uh, the public meeting protocols uh, are in flux, as we all know right now. So we'll let you know whether our next meeting is, is going to be virtual or at Sandag. Um, and so do we have any comments from the working group members from any of the panelists? Hearing none, um, any questions from the public? Clerk, I don't see anybody, but no. Wonderful. No well, thank you all for making the time today and for all your uh, comments and, and questions. And uh, we are officially adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Sam. Thank everyone. Thank you, everyone. Good to see you all. Thank you all.